Simple Cyber Defense Security Updates for July 21st, 2021. back to the Simple Cyber Defense Podcast. This week we have some very interesting and important topics. We're going to be talking about the never-ending print nightmare that is going on and how to mitigate that. And we're also going to be talking about how your Google Assistant is spying on you. So, my name is Carl. I'm joined with... Hi, this is Ahmad. And we're going to get right into it right now. So... Many topic, you know, many news outlets have gone over the uh, multiple print nightmare scenarios where Microsoft is basically sounding the alarm, saying that the hackers could easily get into your system through your printers. And basically, the issue happened a couple months back when some researchers discovered this vulnerability and sent it to Microsoft responsibly, and Microsoft looked at it and issued a patch. However, the patch didn't fully fix the issue, and the issue was there was two vulnerabilities happening with the print spoolers. Now, the print spooler is the piece of software that is responsible for all the printing that happens on your computer, whether it's locally or through the network. And what the attackers were able to do was they were able to use the vulnerability in the print spooler to give them advanced privileges that will allow them to do basically anything they wanted on your computer without even your knowledge or even your input. And once they had that, they were able to send out fake print drivers to your computer, which would then reach out to the internet and download malware. And since they had the elevated privileges, the computer would just say, okay, this is exactly what the user wanted, so we're just going to install it, and there's not going to be any question about it. And this was very dangerous. So the researcher gave this information to Microsoft. And Microsoft made the mistake to only patch one part of the issue, which was the elevated privileges issue. But the other part was still in there. And the and then another research team saw that the patch was out, and they were saying, oh, okay, so it's safe to send out this proof of concept that will you know, show how it could have been done, but it was mitigated. Well, unfortunately, the patch didn't work. So once the researchers published their their findings, it was it was basically given a blueprint to the hackers of how to exploit this, and they took advantage of it right away. So now we come into today's uh, this week's where. Microsoft is telling people to disable the spooler in order to stop these attacks from happening. Well, unfortunately, if you disable your spooler, you won't be able to print anything on your computer. So that's fine if you don't have any printers, but if you do have a printer, you'd have to turn it on and off every time you want to print, which could be kind of a hassle for some people. Because not only do you have to remember how to turn it off and how to turn it back on, but you have to do it every single time you want to print. So there is another workaround to this. Uh, You could go through the group policies and disable what is known as allow print spooler to accept client connections. What this basically does mean that it will allow you to print locally but it will not allow anything to be printed over a network. So since most home users don't have a network for printing, this is a really good option for them. And I really 
recommend everyone to do this right now. Either if you don't have any printers on there, just disable the spooler altogether. Or if you do have a printer, but you and since home users don't really print over the network, I recommend going through disabling the remote uh, clients. Now to do the disabling of the spooler locally, what you'll do is you'll do you'll press the Windows key in R to invoke a run dialog. When the run dialog opens up, you'll type in services.msc, hit enter to open up the services. In the service window, you'll scroll and locate the print spooler services. You'll double click on that entry, open up its properties window. In there, you'll move to the general tab and move to the second section titled services status selection. You'll click the start button to enable it or to disable it you hit the stop. And this will take care of the ability to remotely install drivers because the spooler won't run and so it won't accept any new drivers. So the hacker won't be able to send in the drivers to uh, to install the malware. Now if you want to configure the and block the remote networking printing, what you're going to do is you're going to go to your search bar and type in for group policies and then you're going to go to computer configuration slash administrative templates and then you're going to find something that says allow printer spooler to accept client connections and then you're going to right click that and then you're going to put in a block so that it will not allow remote printing at all now after you do all this you have to restart the spooler which would which would allow the settings to take effect. Now you go in through the same way as disabling the spooler, but instead of disabling it, you're just going to uh, stop it and start it. An easier way is just to reboot your PC and then everything will take effect from there. Now the reason why the attack is able to happen in the first place and this is not affecting other drivers is because Microsoft in the past has made the decision to force every single driver that is to be installed on the computer to be digitally signed by the manufacturer. So if it doesn't have a valid signature, it won't be installed. But for whatever reason, they decided that printers do not need to follow this method. So since they are not digitally signed, anyone could create a print driver and install it and since they have the elevated privileges they basically have the entire uh, they basically have cont entire control over your computer and any questions from that you have on mind uh so now not everybody understands what a digital signature of a, of a file is can you want to elaborate on that okay. a little bit so basically a digital signature is like, it's kind of like a physical signature, except it's not able to be forged because there's what's known as a private key and a public key. Now the private key is like a super secret, kind of like a password that no one will know. And it's kept privately hidden away from everyone's eyesight. And then the public key is what's given out to everyone to show proof that, okay, this signature that I've given you is actually my signature and not someone else's signature. So the the way I, I kind of to bring it closer to is the way I imagine a private and a public key, it's actually not two keys, it's a lock and key. So they kind of fit in with one another. So to bring it closer to, you know, our perception here, 
And when they when they fit together, then we know okay, this guy fits with this guy. Then I can communicate with this file, or I can you know, do whatever I want with this file. Yeah, yeah. trust it. Yeah. So it's like a trust. It's everything's more like a trust because with cryptography, the concept is don't trust anyone, and you have to keep your secret secret. And this public and private thing is a way to get that trust together. So you have like the interlock key saying okay this is the person because only that person has this part and only this person has this part and when they come together boom yep. it locks in and you can trust them. right yep. now the, we know that Microsoft um, didn't require a digital signature for those drivers because this issue is going on now but how do you know there are other drivers that don't require digital signatures that could cause the same thing? You know? It's because doing some research through here that I'm going to provide links in the description for you to go further into this. But um, So every time you, you uh, install a driver, a lot of times you'll have this little pop-up window that will show up and then it'll say the name of the company of, that uh, is trying to install the driver. That's basically the name of the, the digital signature that's on there. A lot of times when you install print drivers, you don't get this little pop-up window that pops up and say, okay, do you, are you sure you want to install this yes or no? That indicates that there is no digital signature involved. Okay. So if it, if it could just install itself without administ administrative rights, which a lot of print drivers can do, mm -hmm. that shows you that there's no digital signature involved because there's nothing to check against. But every right. other driver, you always have that little pop-up that says, hey, this is the company that's trying to install something. Do you want to allow it? Yes or no? There's I see. That the digital signature involved in that. Once you hit okay. the yes, give it the admin rights, and then you run through the installation of the driver. And plus, there is a way to check is if you go to the device manager, you can actually see this digital signature right. that is involved in drives. that driver. So right. I'm going to create a blog post on simplecyberdefense.com that goes over how to disable the spoolers, how to disable the remote thing, and how to check to see drivers or non-drivers on there. So it gives you a little bit more explanation so you can see what's going on with pictures and so that it will be a little bit more easier to understand than trying to listen through a podcast or watching right. audio on YouTube or something like that. Right. All right, perfect. All right. I guess we'll move on to the uh, Google Assistant. All right, so um, uh, Google was, uh, there's an article uh, from Android Authority uh, where they had uh, contacted Google and to get clarification on uh, the Google Assistant and how it could be listening to us without it being summoned. And we know that, that you know, for we have our Google Assistant on our phones and, uh, you know, if you have a Google speaker at home or any other Google devices that you may be using, uh, those devices are generally on standby. And then there is, there, in it, it saved your, your voice signature and that's how you're able to activate your assistant. So by saying, hey, Google, uh, you can, you can um, activate it. Now, it was discovered that Google secretly records some of your conversation even without you saying the activation word, hey, Google, or hey, Google, or whatever. And this was brought up to Google, and Google kind of uh, waited a while to, to respond. Um, until eventually on you know on on July in, in July um, the the admitted that the Google assistant records 
the user's audio even when it is not triggered by the hot it's called the hot word um and if you know for us to when, when we do some research on that uh you know google uh said the, the they gave us a link to check out the the safety center and to see it to understand okay this is what this is what happens when uh you talk to your google assistant well some of the the explanation that google gave was okay sometimes your phone thinks you're saying hey google and it doesn't so this would be one of those times that may be recording some of the conversations that it may not be authorized to record at other times they're saying google listens so that they may it, it improves the speech recognition of the device and of user's voice and user's commands also what there's what they're saying is that some of the google employees listen to small few second snippets of these conversations of this audio um, when conversation is detected um, so now we have three issues we have unauthorized recording of data of my personal data personal eye defining information i have the second issue is i don't know where that information is being stored or whether it's being stored securely or not the third thing is there's an actual live person somewhere in the world that is listening to the conversations to some of the conversations that i'm having with with my device so there is it, it's a big privacy issue um and Google calls this uh, standby mode, and what's this? Do? And they're saying standby mode. You know, the device will process short snippets of the audio, a few seconds. Now, if I say, "Hey Google, do this for me," it's not, it's going to take less than a few seconds. So, if Google is trying to downplay this issue, saying, "Hey, we we'll only listen for a few seconds on standby mode," which it, this is to me, this is not acceptable. Now. Uh, also, they're saying that what sometimes what, the, what Google Assistant does is that when it detects the hot word, is it will record a few seconds before you saying those hot, that hot those hot that hot word. Well, kind of like um, uh, when you take a picture with uh, you know those live photos and you take a picture and it, a few seconds before it had taken a, a short video. Well, I didn't authorize you to do that. I activated you when I said the hot word. Now, really, there there is no work around this at the time. You know, we really have to take Google's word for it and and trust that they're being, you know, they're ethically using that information and they're securely protecting it as a as a large corporation. But at the same time, if you've read the uh, Edward Snowden's book, uh, Permanent Record, um, we know that everything we do, everything we say, there is a record of it somewhere. Otherwise, we wouldn't have zeta bytes of data being stored, you know, in, in, in by large corporations all over the country, all over the world, in different data centers. Uh, so, the way I do this with, on my phone is honestly, I do not have Google Assistant activated. Uh, you know, some people may think, "Oh, this is this is backwards thinking." You know, you're not in this industry, especially somebody like me in the in the industry. Need to be keep need to keep up with the trends. Well, that is fine and dandy. I need I need to understand how it works. But then when I see that it's jeopardizing the privacy, my privacy, then I need to make you know take steps to mitigate that risk. Uh, Carl, what do you think is is the best way to mitigate this? Well, like I said, I've, like if you have an iPhone, you're a little bit safer from the Google, but you still have the issue with Siri. And I would even go into further, if you have an Android phone, it's the Google Assistant is baked into it, so it's a little harder to disable, but you can go into the setting or into the permissions for that particular app and just deny it the microphone. Right. And there's also some other apps out there that you can go through and find to disable microphones when you're not using them in the background and stuff like that there are like many dedicated websites and reddit communities out there dedicated to the privacy sector out here right and it, it's a big issue because like not only is google doing this 
but Amazon's doing it with their Echoes, and Apple's doing it with their Siri. They're always listening for that trigger word, because it's kind of weird how, if you think about it, how does my phone know that I'm saying the trigger word unless it's always listening to me? And you can even go into your Google activities and see all of the times that you used or where Google thought you used the trigger word. And you can listen to exactly what they've recorded. And I've done this and I've heard conversations that I had with coworkers where I didn't even say anything remotely close to the trigger word, but yet it, it recorded 30 seconds of our conversation. Wow, 30 yeah, seconds. 30 seconds of our conversation. And, and that's what Google refers to as few seconds. Yeah, and imagine yeah. if you were talking about sensitive content during that. It's out in the public now because yeah. who knows, like you said, who knows how they're protecting it because yeah. Google isn't being forthcoming of it. At first, right. when, like you said, it's first when they were brought this issue up, they kind of just shrugged it off like, yeah, it's no big deal. And then now they're going, okay, since more people are making a big deal out of this, I guess we're going to talk about it a little bit more. So if you really, really want to be protected against this, what I would do, which probably would be going on to more of the extreme version, is either get a phone, because they're, now they're coming up with phones that are Linux-based, that don't have any Google or Apple stuff on it, and they're trying to make it a lot more user-friendly. But I would lean towards getting one of those phones instead of a Google or an Apple phone. And who, who makes one manufacturer like Huawei and Xiaomi and all these guys? There? What they do is they take uh, Samsung phones and basically okay. strip away all the Google stuff out of it and put in a Linux machine. So they basically flash the entire memory out of it. So they anything Google, anything on that phone is completely wiped off and destroyed. And okay. they then install their Linux operating system on there. Now, the downside of that, you don't have the, the Google apps that you're used to or the Apple apps that you're used to. You have to basically start from scratch. But at the same time, it's how important is your privacy? Like, Do you want to be listened constantly or do you actually want to take control of your privacy a little bit? So that's kind of like a trade-off when you use these technologies is are you okay with Google knowing a little bit more information about you or do you want to keep that information private? So it's kind of like the trade-off. Like you get free stuff or you where you have to pay mostly through your, your uh, data or you take away your data but you have to pay through it by using other alternative technologies to do what you need to do. So it's, that, that's the kind of trade-off you need to think about. Uh, an interesting uh, podcast I just listened to last week. Uh, it's, uh, it's called uh, uh, The Eighth Layer. Yeah. Um, have you heard of, okay. heard of it? And the last, yeah, yeah, if you haven't listened to it, do yourself a favor and listen to it. Uh, cyber wires, eighth layer. Not cyber Yeah. Yep. Um, and the last episode they did last week or the week before, and it, it was kind of—it's really eye-opening. It was about to to defeat the to as as people as human beings we fall victim to deception, and that's how social engineers come in and they're able to. Find out more information. If they have one piece of information, they use human nature to their advantage. They're not trying to trick us. They're just using human nature to get more information to achieve their goal. And the end of the episode was something that was really mind-boggling, which is why do we put our real information online? You could have, you could be a totally different person, mm -hmm. totally different name, phone number, email address, Anything, even when it's to the point where you your security questions, yeah. 
the, you, you give them you give fake information so that all the information about you on the web is the information that you choose to be out there which yep. is totally you're using deception in your you know exactly and it's mind as simple as it is it was it was really eye opening yep. you know if i because who needs to know my real name my employer and my, even my family doesn't need to know what they really do your employer and, and your friends any anybody online even if, even if, even on LinkedIn, like I thought about this as a cyber professional, why is it my information all on LinkedIn and anybody can yeah. access that? You know, I can put a fake name on there, and then when an employer reaches out, <laughs> fake everything, yeah. right? The employer reaches out, all right. And now we're doing the paperwork. You're going to pay me, all right? Here's my real information, my social security number, and all that. I don't. I think that would be a smart thing to do. So. Why don't we do the same thing now as, as having a, a, a digital persona and teaching your Google assistant, that digital persona of who you are on the web, for, that's a nice shield puts it right in front of who you are and nobody can, nobody knows who you are. Nobody can attack. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's a little bit of food for thought. Yeah. And that's another uh, question. A lot of these privacy uh, groups online through Reddit or the privacy tools, IO or, PiracyTools.io basically talk about the same things about why are we giving away this information. Like, yes, we are getting free stuff, but we're not really required to give them real information. Yes. Or even, like I even just recently created a, a blog post on SimpleCyberDefense.com where I go over ways to create email aliases so that you give Facebook, you don't give Facebook your real email address, you give them one of your aliases. Same thing with the bank account and the streaming services. You don't give them your real email address, you give them something else that you created so that they don't know your real email address. Because again, it could be easier to link yourself into if you get just enough information together and then say, okay. This person's email address is this. He lives here uh, on Facebook. He posted about these couple of things. And then they just make a little profile. And then these hackers will just say, okay, this is who I have to pretend to be to trick him to do this. And then bada beam, bada boom, they take over your account and wipe your bank account or do whatever they want. And then you sit there like, why did I do this? <laughs> yeah. It's because you yeah. just manipulate I, it little by little. Yeah. And that's done, you know, if, I don't know if you're aware of this tool, but there's a tool called Multigo. Have you heard of it? I've heard of it, yeah. And, yeah, and all, all I need to do is I can put in there just one thing about you. Two things, three, however many things I have, like name and phone number, mm -hmm. photo and address, uh, yeah, email address and, 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 and Facebook ID or whatever. And then what Multigo will do is it will create a web crawler and it'll go out on the web and find things that are similar yep. and yeah, and connect it into a web and I'll have net within a day or two, depending on how much information are out there on the web about you and how much crawling it needs to do, I can have everything about you, even things that you don't know are out on the web. Uh, so that's, 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 that's very important. The digital age that we're living in, I, I, I honestly think that digital alias thing is, is an awesome idea. Yeah. So that way you can, like, again, put a little layer of buffer yeah. between you and the web. Like yeah. you said, you don't need to give out your information, especially the security information, which is pretty quite right. It's like if you right. put in, like, say, what's your mother's maiden name? or what street you grew up on. And then you go to right. these Facebook accounts, and then you see these people post around saying, oh, your, uh, your uh, rapper name is the first thing that you did, plus the street you grew up on. And then all of a sudden, it's like, wait a minute. A little bit here, a little bit there. And then all of a sudden, I have all your security <laughs> questions, and I can just go to reset your password, and I'm in your yep. account. <laughs> yep, yep. Don't forget to share it with your friends so they oh, can yeah. do the same thing. Share it with your friends because the more information they need, the better. So they don't want just your account. They want everyone's account. Yeah. 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 Cool. Yep. 
Uh, well, you know, I think I think that's uh, that should that should do it. Unless unless you have anything else, any other comments? No, I think say. that'll do it. So this will end this episode, and hopefully you'll look out for the next episode, and we'll see you in the next one. Yep. If you like what was in this episode, please consider liking, subscribing, and sharing with others. For more information, to suggest a topic, or to donate, head over to simplecyberdefense.com.